Hey, what's up, Whitney? How great. Thanks for doing my podcast. Uh, yeah, oh, how are we doing? It's awesome. Um, uh, you don't mind if I slam the room first before we oh, get please, going? Oh, please. No, let's go. I'm well, so, are we started or no? We've started. We're rolling. Yes. Whitney, I did, <laughs> Whitney, thanks for having me. I didn't know you ran a charter school. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little creepy sitting here in front of the uh, the craft the craft uh, bin. This is a Montessori school. And Everybody, this... pick out an animal that represents you. Go ahead. This is a therapist's office, yes, a child therapist's right. office. Yeah, these chairs are pretty so, low. So we're picking, we're figuring out what you're picking up to diagnose yeah. you. You've mm-hmm. so far picked up a box of cigarettes and nothing else. <laughs> There we go. We're dinosaurs. The, the opaque dinosaurs. That's perfect. We're comedians that do comedy live. We are dinosaurs. So, I feel, I've never felt older. I've got some uh, babies downstairs blood for you to drink. Oh, really? We can take uh, 10 years off your age right now from, uh, from a smoothie I have in the freezer. Thank, you know, I have a vitamin joke. Do you think that's like already like so old that it's like people are like, what is that? Uh, I'd love to hear about it. Okay. A vitamin I've, I, You know, joke. I figured I'd talk about, you know, multivitamins, you know, as an old man and everything like that. He, I could see the crowd turned off. They rolled their eyes. That's, I miss uh, like Centrum Silver. Can Rogan, yes, hey, can Onyx I have a Centrum just... Silver joke. It's a multivitamin for men. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, like, like, here's the problem with your your vitamins, like. I literally, my gag reflex is so strong from auditioning in Hollywood, I guess. I I cannot swallow. I am at the point where all these vitamins I'm supposed to take, I open them and put the powder uh, right. in a water. I understand. Because I, when I take a NyQuil, I'm like, like make, I can't. You make it more of a supplement. I can't even get a Z-Quil down at this point. Really? My gag reflex, yeah. I well, don't, let me ask you, how's your sleep? Are you sleeping? I've never slept a day in my life. What's it like? I have the problem, same thing too, but that's what everybody who, uh, you know, if you have any kind of problem, they always diagnose sleep and water. Well, let me say- Are you drinking enough water, A couple Whitney? things. How was your sleep? But here's the, That's here's, all they care about. Well, now they make science bracelets that tell you how you slept. Oh, really? Right? You know, like whoop band, like stuff like that. They now, but let me- let me. Does that explain the balloons? <laughs> we'll be right back. The white balloon that- <laughs> um, What's uh, your balloon joke? Just came it. in from China. I don't- uh, uh, well, no, remember the Chinese white balloon? Yeah, Any- that's what I'm talking about. Oh, good. See, every time something happens. What other balloon? Is there another balloon now? Look, heroin balloons. And oh. I live in LA. People wow. are heroin balloon, fentanyl mules. No, balloon could have my tits. You could have been talking about my tits. <laughs> I'm, I apologize. I'm talking about the balloons that were The Chinese our balloon that uh, Elon Musk travels in? I don't well, know. Well, I said that um, I don't know what that balloon was doing, but my phone flashed an ad for Panda <laughs> Express. And you could see the outrage in the young crowd. <laughs> I don't know. I looked at it. It was like looking in the mirror uh, when I wake up in the morning with no makeup on. Um, <laughs> that balloon looks like half my friends without makeup on. So I got confused. I thought it was like, I thought it was. Uh, it's my... yesterday's news. That's all I know. Look, there I, are, everyone's moved past. I'm it. fascinated by that because it's like I, whenever news happens for the past like 15 years I always go like what's Dave's joke like I remember seeing you at, I'm like such a stalker of yours and it's gonna what? Be, I remember yeah. remember when there was the snow in in the Denver airport oh yeah this is like 10 years ago <laughs> you were at Caroline's and I was uh, at Gotham or some shit mm-hmm. um uh in the green room with surrounded by the Voss water no I was at comics remember oh, okay. comics with an yes. x Yes. I remember going in the green room and seeing Voss Water and being like, well, this club won't be around long. <laughs> and I was like headlining it. And uh, you were at Caroline's in between my shows. I would run to see you oh, at you did. Caroline's. And um, I out. just was like, how does he have 45 minutes on something that happened two days ago? Um, and you would write in these uh, composition notebooks. Like I saw, like you would, you know. Really? I never considered myself a notebook guy. I was more of a, uh, you know those yellow pads? That was my name for a while, yellow pad. This is the only way. Yeah, that's, to that's do, what I like. This is what, I, dude. Because you can rip them and make that like throwing it at the, uh, no, get rid of it. I literally think about it and go like, when I'm found dead alone in my house, because mm-hmm. I've fallen down this flight of stairs, because I'm not meant to live in a home, I'm meant to live in a tiny apartment. They'll know where my jokes are because it'll be yellow. Yeah, the yellow pad. They'll know I like that. That this isn't my suicide note. These are my jokes. The suicide note is like by I the yellow legal pad. I like that. And because I think there's something, I know this is gonna sound annoying to the people listening. There's something kind of that makes 
me feel like this is a legitimate job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because it's a legal pad. Like you're taking a deposition. <laughs> L- look, it's literally like, yeah, totally. <laughs> it's like taint joke, dick joke. The vaccine is a scam. And then I'm like. <laughs> yes. That, that, <laughs> mm. And I feel like a secretary who has a legitimate job. And when it sucks, you get to rip it up and like, oh, it makes a lot of noise. Everybody's like, what's going on? And there? then after I wrote five scribbles on the first page, that's it. Oh, there's some. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. then empty. No, then I then I go back to drawing usually. This is my current joke, like. You really are hardcore with the jokes. I love. But that. I don't put it. I, I only started writing them in documents mm-hmm. to date them because I'm so afraid someone's going to accuse me of stealing jokes, and then I'll go, oh no, it's dated. So I do send now. Right. Every new joke at the end of the day, I write it, date it, email it to myself, and. See, oh, that's a great idea. Because I remember, like Fortune Feimster, dear dear friend. We were both doing a joke about um, Red Rover, Red Rover, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. That, how dangerous, like, it was some, like some joke about, like, the last thing I did about um, when people like, cell phones are so dangerous for kids. Like, we played Red Rover. Yeah, I hear you. And, you know, whatever. And she texted me and was like, oh, I'm doing a Red Rover joke. And it was so chill. It wasn't like, like, we were like, I'm doing one, you're doing one. How long, what's yours? Like, we had the most adult thing about it and I was like oh I think we can both keep doing them ours are so different sure but if someone was like I've been I can go you can have it I never like please but I just want you to know right this email I did have it before and I would never steal a joke that's my I get fanatical about joke checking I'll call up all the all the people I know who are joke writers and I'm like have you heard this have you heard anyone do this have you heard anything like it and then I'll have like you know, when you start watching specials, then you got to go rewatch them again to make sure you're not doing someone's joke. So it's like, it's an endless loop in your head. But it's Dave, almost like this, like, this, like, just constant, like, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know, you know, and it's like, I think the way you do it is good, where you, you, you write it, you date it to yourself, and then you know that you have a record of the joke. And also, like, Dave, you realize, like, any time any comic thinks of something funny, we all go... Dave must have done this already, right? We uh, literally call well, each other. Not, that's we not, call each other, going like, "Did we steal this from Dave? Because it's too funny." Is there a left turn in it? it is, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, is there a clown at the end? Yeah, exactly. But I think it's like, I think I'm. The more jokes you think of, I guess, the more paranoid you get. And I also think my self esteem. It's so funny how low you. Re- it reveals how low your self esteem is in that moment because you're like, I just thought of something hilarious. I must have stolen it well, <laughs> by great, accident. Do you want the great news? Please. There's a place where you don't have to think like that at all. It's called TikTok. Just lip sync someone else's act and accrue followers and then just basically chin up, go, hey, I'm awesome, you know? If you talk about my biological clock one more time, I will call (laughs) HR. Last night at 3.19 a.m., I wrote this. None of us have any time anymore from all the time we're saving. Wait, none of us have any time anymore. We're uh, like, we're slammed from all these time-saving apps. Mm. Like, has anyone saved time using Amazon? By the time you order it and complain about it, it's been six hours. Mm -hmm. Like, you've actually, ordering from Amazon, I actually lose four hours complaining Mm -hmm. and feeling guilty about the driver who has to shit in the bag. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So it's like- That's a great, that's a great, uh, see, for me, it's always like the, the actual thought uh, thought process is great. It's like the the apps do they really save time and they really they really don't. We're so busier right there, than ever. We get yeah. our food delivered. We get do- our groceries delivered. We we uh, uh, we don't have to call and wait to buy a plane ticket anymore. We do it all online. We have auto pay. Yes, and we're the busiest we've ever been. Yet I have fifty apps on my phone that are promising to save me time with running errands. Sure. You know I, what I'm hear, I so, totally, I totally. So then I go. There's like a seed of a bit there, like the great irony. For sure, that's like the 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 dating app experience, right? I'm not on any of those, but for people, it's like you know, to meet to meet a hundred losers. Do you know how many nights that I have to be out? It's like I can meet them all in one like one one swipe. So that's the uh, that's how it works. <laughs> This show is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. So it's like going to the gym for your brain, right? So we never say, you know, oh, I've been going to the gym for 10 years, so now I never have to go again. You know, you never, you don't think that way. So it's like I always come out of it saving time. 
because I'm not wasting a bunch of time worrying about things I can't control. So that's that's the whole idea of therapy. It's just the idea of like, we're actually going to save you time Let's by releasing a lot of stuff here so that you don't waste a bunch of time doing things driven by shame, guilt, uh, don't say yes to things that you should be saying no to. So I think the only thing I'll say is me going to, I go to therapy first and foremost because it frees up time that I would otherwise be wasting worrying about things I can't control. Visit betterhelp.com slash Whitney today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Whitney. Can I do a quick surprise for you? Yeah, sure. I hate surprises, but sure. I know you do. <laughs> this is my surprise. I, David Tell, I just want to make him laugh. That I don't care if you've, you've got, already made me laugh so many all times. All I want to do is make him my laugh. My catheter has fallen out th- well, several <laughs> times while I was so, on your podcast. What is the name of the podcast, by the way? Uh, this is called The Insomniac. All right. So Joan Dangerfield is with court. us. The great Joan Dangerfield is joining us. David Tell hey, is here. Hey, Joan. What's up? How are you? Where are you? Good. She lives in my computer now. What's going on? Where are you headed? Oh, you're in this house, I think. Are you? It's a big house. There's two time zones. Yes. She's in my basement. That's where I yes. keep her. Joan, are you coming by the podcast? I'm kidnapping Joan next weekend. I'm taking her to Austin for the opening of Joe's Club. Oh, that's going to be great. And How exciting is that? Isn't that cool? So- yeah. I can't believe you're taking me, Whitney, by the way. I can't believe. I thought you were calling to cancel. To cancel? And I was ready to, like. <laughs> How do you have lower self-esteem than me? It's shocking. So can I ask you the quick, quickest thing ever? So, yes. So, yes. So can you see? So Rodney, I wanted to talk through how Rodney, on his sets, what all of the um, numbers and letters mean. Am I allowed to do that real quick, or you have to go talk to a lawyer? Um, you and, are. And sue someone for stealing his stuff, or? <laughs> no, it's fine. I can answer. I can answer. So could you walk us through? So I'm happy to. This is. 60, I, I need to see a little more of it. If so, you could, sorry. If you could 60, like 64. So the upper left-hand corner where it says 64 of Rodney Dangerfield's sets. Should yeah. I just smash this open and pull it out? 64. Uh, no. Yeah, that's his 64th um, spot. He used to call him Spot. Spot on Johnny Carson. And I can't quite see, but you can his page numbers one and looks like one and two. One. You're going the wrong direction as far yeah, as I'm going to stand up. Yeah, well, that's the first page days. of his stand up. Please. And, and the second page of the Sorry. Okay, mm. can you oh. see me? This is like, yeah. I am the worst that's person. Better. Sorry, this is why Joe Rogan got $300 million. And why I'm blowing um, better health. Yeah, I'll hold it and you can go so, ahead. So, so, no, don't cover Dave. Oh, so, oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> so, this that, means six, got 64th yeah. Tonight Show. Yes. Um, right. The, the black check mark and the red check mark next to a joke. Means that he got applause, which meant more uh, than laughter. Hold on, hold on. Wow. Can I, can I make sure I'm micing you one second? Oh, so this is his like um. Yes. Af- is- after after the set. So he'd write mm-hmm. the set out, and then afterwards yes. he'd go backstage, and if yes. he got laughter, he got a black check mark. Red meant applause. Um. Actually, he didn't do the check mark right after the show. He did it after he watched the recording of the show or listened to the recording of the show. And which is yeah. the jokes? W- w- is this blue writing? Is that his handwriting? Yes. Oh, well, wow. He would actually switch pens so that the punchline was uh, in bold. Oh, okay. And that's what he did with like a Sharpie, like a much thicker pen. So the, the blue handwriting, that's, that's him you know, doing the setup for the joke. The blue is the setup and the, uh, and the punchline is in the bold. Oh, see, I yes. do. I, wow, that's interesting. And then what does the A mean? The applause. Oh, right? applause. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. A, sorry, I was just trying to put my computer in Do Not Disturb. We're having an incredible comedy history moment, and the fucking... <laughs> but this is... I'm, I'm sorry, Whitney, Please. but... Uh, for a Tonight Show set, he would tell, I would say, plus 50 jokes, because I just did a... Uh, I was, I was, someone asked me to 
do a documentary, uh, be a part of a documentary on Rodney, and we got to look at his notes. Ruben, Rick Rubin. Rick That's Rubin. Okay, okay cool. Yeah, Rick Rubin. And uh, I thought it was really cool and way overdue because Rodney is, th there was no one like him. But I think Rick Rubin was the only person who could have done that. Yeah, it was interesting how he set it up. But when you, when you see how many jokes per minute, that uh, Rodney would do because the setups, the setups were brief, but they totally. It, it was just like there was no fat on a joke. Zero fat. Zero fat, and that is like in he today's times where you fat. like you're eating a pan of fat. Like it's it's pretty amazing. It's a, it's. Dave, it, Dave, did you know that that's what Rodney called it? No fat. Really? Said the same phrase. I don't know if that's like a common comedy thing or 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 not. But wow, that's what that makes me feel good because I think we we talk that fat. way too. Yeah. <laughs> no fat and. And Some people called him like a, a master editor because he wanted the joke to be as short as possible. Um, but that's because he thought everyone had a short attention span like he did. He wanted to get to it really quick. Mm -hmm. That's always what um, Howard Stern would say. And then for all of you that think huh? I have ADD and I cut people off and stuff, <laughs> Howard Stern would say, if I'm bored, that means the audience has been bored. Oh, that's right. interesting. So, well, Howard's also a master. So of... just cut. If you need to interrupt people, mm -hmm. do it. Because yeah. I'm looking at Paul McCartney, and I'm it's four in the morning or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm If I'm bored, the person with four jobs and three p kids in the back seat is already bored. So it's like... Yeah. yeah. I, and Ronnie I, was the same way, and also very respectful of other people's time. Like, he wanted his book... His, the biggest compliment about his autobiography that he got from a reader was that they read it in, in one night. Really? You know, was, was glad. Yeah, they was glad. No <laughs> self-indulgence. And I think that, that comics who worked, uh, for lack of a better word, blue-collar jobs know how little time most people have. Mm -hmm. So... So, I, so, so I've worked in service. Yeah, you don't, they don't have a lot of time mm -hmm. to, to listen to yes. their comedy in this self-indulgent shit where we're, <laughs> we're going on stage where people that have four jobs are like, I need to laugh right now. This is medicine. I'm coming here to get medicine. Yeah. And right. and I, I have a babysitter that that I have to pay overtime right, if right. you don't get these jokes to me faster. It's like, it's like Rodney, it's like fast food. You know, we're service people. You know, I hate it when I have to wait an hour for my steak to come to my table. I'm like, where's my, I have to get home and comedians, we're kind of doing that. We're like, mm -hmm. you know? Well, the, the other thing I really liked about Rod, I think that's all true, like when you can see from both sides of the uh, experience. But with Rodney, that they, there's a lot of great that I like about Rodney, but one of them is that he's super relatable, yet he really was never a crowd guy. He was never like, I'm going to jump in the crowd and talk to everybody. He, he basically yeah. did his job. You know, he was up there doing doing the jokes, and the crowd was there to listen. And I know when he started, it was not like it is today. So these were really rough and tumble, like halls and like bars and Smoking whatever he played. Inside, he probably couldn't see the crowd through the opaque smoke. True. Yeah. And they're drinking. That, yeah. Back then, they started drinking at 11 a.m. Right, and Their they really span was they were gonna. They and the crowd would tell you if if you if, if they didn't like you, they they were not like basically. I'll get it all out on the there web. They would tell you right there, you where, suck at all. Oh, the comedian has 10 security guards, and right. because they have Lyme disease, we're not allowed to throw shit at them. Right, you know what I'm saying? So it's like. It, well, that's like, very cool. Can you tell us, Joan, and we can cut this out if it's too personal, um, about him? in parking lots, people being aggressive with him? Yeah, he'd get beat up if, if they didn't like his jokes. Yeah. He was careful even like when he was working Vegas. If if the audience was crowding around him and they expected to shake his hand or something, he wouldn't do that because he was afraid they were going to pull him down and then punch him because that would remind him back of the old days. Right. You know, when there used to be like a lot of um, hooligans or whatever you want to call them at comedy shows uh, in the olden days because... We call them feature acts. The comedian. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because you know sometimes he was performing with strippers and dog acts and and you know all kinds of things like that back when he was first getting started. And he did get punched out a few times. He he told me about one particular parking lot incident where he he then went to the mirror to see if you know uh, how he looked, but he couldn't even go off. Um, with oftentimes the security guards punching him out. 
Um, why? I don't know. He thought it was because maybe he didn't do a good enough job. In your experience, do you think, because I think now we're going, oh, violence against comedians is like new. We saw Chris Rock get punched in the face. No one stood up Mm -hmm. as we watched our friend get assaulted. No one in Hollywood stood up. Um, uh, Not not true at all. I mean, but also in Jim Jeffries getting punched in the face in uh, Australia, like even if you don't like someone's joke, Caparulo at um, Hermosa Comedy Magic Club. Mm. So is is I think we're now going people are going, oh, all of a sudden it's dangerous to be a stand up comedian. I think it's safe no, to say it's, it's always dangerous. It's it, always dangerous. And physically. Me that, that the most, yeah, physically dangerous. And Ronnie told me the first thing you had to do was be likable. Um, you know, that that was more important than even being funny. You've got to be likable when you're on stage. So he was very conscientious about that. Like, as in, please don't kill so that you don't, so that you don't kill me. He's another, here's another, here's another great thing about Rodney. Cause you, you remember his earlier act when he was more of an esoteric, he didn't have the strong punchlines. He didn't have these great, these great, basically set up kill, move on, set up, kill, where he was more rambling and, you know, with his look where he would sweat and all that kind of stuff, it really looked like he was, uh, you know, in in the hole, as I call it. But that was his old act. I, was, I think I saw him on, it was like Ed Sullivan or Jack Parr or something like that. And then when you see how he basically looked at that and said, this isn't working, and he went back and he basically retooled his whole thing and turned it into this, I like to call it like a punchline machine. I mean, yeah, the guy's yeah. a factory of jokes. And like, he wouldn't give him a chance to even like breathe. So I was like, that's amazing that he looked at what he was doing and said like, it is me, it's not the crowd and this is not working. And I'm gonna like basically retool what I do, reimagine it, whatever they call it nowadays. And it, and it turned into like ultimate success. So, and then we also, cause when, when Dave came in today. Can you get a chair? Cause this is really like, no. <laughs> it's like daddy daughter day over here. No, so here, no, sit down. no I'm, I'm gonna bring a chair over here. <laughs> let me, let me do something. So can really I tell you something? something? I used to um, behind the curtain when Rodney was performing in in Vegas. And I wish she, this is why men have money and women don't in this business. Cause I, I, if I had self-esteem, I would have just said, can you come by? But I wouldn't, you know, now I'm on like, like Boingo Wireless is sabotaging this conversation. Of Wi-Fi. No, no, no. I want. I, I want to s- be on the television. Oh, but oh, don't let me. Really don't don't here. let them know that Byron Allen's texting <laughs> I me. We were two grad students <laughs> watching stuff on, the on your laptop. Have her, have her <laughs> there she <laughs> is. Oh my gosh. Can you go back to your chair? Well, okay, you look okay. great, Joan. Honestly. Oh shit! Oh no! It's okay. Oh, oh my god! Oh, Get my that god. dog no, in here. Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! Get your mom's ashes, quick! Hold on. Let's read. Let's read a minute. Dave let's. just spilled his coffee on my carpet. Now I can put it on eBay. This is my retirement <laughs> plan, Dave. Don't touch it. Don't clean it up. Uh, just another brown spot. Every, <laughs> everything we do. Something that Dave just reminded me of. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay. So when I used to um, sit backstage when Roddy was performing in this, uh, we were together like 20, 21 years, as a matter of fact. But um, what would happen is I noticed that there was a pattern. He would get a laugh every three to four seconds. Wow. You know how many laughs that is in a one-hour show? And I noticed that, yeah, there was a rhythm to it. There was everything. And I I don't know how he judged when the the exact piece of a second would be to start his next joke. But he had that down to such a science and, and, uh, you know, it was so repetitive that when we would record one show and then listen to a recording of the other, you could practically synchronize them together as if it was just one recording. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing. Yeah. I wish I had that focus. John, I don't know, man. Not only his voice, but like, for example, if you were filming it, like he would push out his knee at the exact same moment each time. Um, Really? He would mop his brow at the same moment. He was actually out there like a robot. But really? With the same heart. Like, I don't know how you guys can tell a joke with the same enthusiasm and... and, and I can't. You know, <laughs> I really can't. Well, second time you tell it, Did you hear that, Whitney? No. She was saying that, I like, don't, I don't from listen. one... From I don't one listen sh- when women talk. From one, from one show to the... When she would listen backstage from one show to the next, that he he basically was getting a laugh every three seconds, right? And then the next show, 
Yeah, three to four seconds. And then on the next show, it, it would be, he wouldn't switch up the order or anything like that just to make it like a little different. He would just basically lock in again, right? And go, and go through exactly. it. Exactly. See, see, he was trying to perfect the performance. I'm, I don't have that kind of, I don't have that follow through and I definitely don't have that like, uh, I guess you could say uh, just, that thing. Because well, my stuff, I can't wait to change the joke. I, he, I, I, he I'm will, destructive. He'll commit... He well he unlike well look I mean I'm big on the way you do anything is the way you do everything he committed to a woman he commits okay. to making a joke perfect I'm not even kidding mm -hmm. you know I have a hard time I get bored of a as soon as a joke starts killing I get bored of it yeah. as soon as someone falls in love with me I'm bored of them I you know I'm just gonna be honest here mm -hmm. you know I think it's like you know Rodney um, also I think comedians like you know our attention spans because we're on social media we're. Blah, 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 our attention spans for we can't even stay in love with our own jokes and the audience is like why you know i i just had a situation this past weekend where i gave audience an audience a bunch of undercooked jokes because i was bored of being perfect and i'm like my job as an entertainer isn't for you guys to watch me stay interested in what i'm doing is my job to deliver a fully cooked i don't get to experience like do you get to go to a restaurant and say yeah. You know, and get something undercooked. What do you feel like? What do you feel like? Yeah, if making? you give me a plate of food that's undercooked, it's I indulge it a little indulgence. Uh, there's a little bit of self indulgence, but I also think audiences now want to see our process. It's mm -hmm. almost like it's more interesting now to see us fail and see us work things out. But I think one of the biggest questions I have for you, uh, besides the millions that I have, because we're <laughs> past life like twins or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, is that um, we're lesbians, guys? I'm coming out as gay. Um, this is this is my girlfriend. Um, what do you need, baby? No, I wanted to mop up that. Uh, don't please thing. don't please don't. Maybe this overpriced water will help. <laughs> you have it, a rag here. Can I? I, I uh, hold on. Just go ahead. Finish your thought, Whitney. No, but I. But it involves you. Hold on, there's a lot of uh, paper towels up there. Yeah, so just so you know, the greatest comedians in the world, they if they spill something, they clean it up, like. Okay. David Tell is right now trying to clean up a spill. I'm begging him to stop cleaning it up. That's why I'm heading to that train wreck. I'm right going to send this carpet to the Lucille Ball Comedy <laughs> Museum on. in Buffalo. I hate this. Anyway, there. Hold on, but, but Dave. But, well, here's the thing. Can I just say, as a, as a fan of Rodney, is that he. His jokes and joke, you know, the jokes and jokes. People look at that part, but there's also the in betweens. And as a comic, you really, you really like, um, you really love, love like when the guys like, you know, like, uh, you know, the uh, dramatic pause and stuff like that. And when he would use the, uh, you know, his catchphrase, which is awesome. I'm, I talk about catchphrases now on stage, but the uh, the 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 catchphrase. What yours is. Jaeger. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. We all, we all think we, we, we hit g goal with our stuff. But that one says it all, and it's like the crowd's waiting for it. And he kind of like would like, you know, like give it to them as almost like a dessert. Like, and I here's no a great respect. joke, and then here's, here's, here's what you came to hear, you know? But they don't respect us. Who? For real. Rodney made me understand this, and I realized that this weekend... In general, well, people don't like jokes the way they used to like jokes. People love repeatable jokes. I remember all these people. These I grew up on Long Island. The, after Rodney would like appear, everybody would be like at wherever I worked. You know, I worked in shipping, receiving. Uh, people would be like, "Hey, you know," they try and redo his jokes and you know retell them. And people love that. They felt like you know he he you know they all were doing his jokes. So like that's not in today's times. Like people don't do that with jokes. But I remember seeing Chris Rock. Uh, uh, at at, he was, oof, this was maybe, this was um, uh, seven years ago, um, back when Hollywood pretended they'd protect him if he got attacked uh, publicly okay. um, on stage. Um, and uh, he was at the comedy store and he was working on new material and he's Chris Rock. So he'd be like, sorry guys, I'm late. I can't like, you know, I'm trying to get my jokes together. The printer didn't work and people would start, and then the audience started laughing. He's like, and he went, stop laughing. Yeah. That wasn't a joke. He was like, please stop laughing because how am I supposed to, and he, he, I'm paraphrasing the great Chris Rock, um, but he said something like, please don't laugh if it's not funny. Just because I'm Chris Rock, basically. 
in parentheses. He wanted to deserve it. He wanted his material yeah, to deserve the Chris puts in the time. He really does the work, you know, on the material. Because I've seen it at the Comedy Cellar in New York. I've seen him, like, get in there and really dig and try and try, try and find where it's supposed to go. So. But I feel a little bit... It's as impressive. A, as a comedian, when you start to get paranoid of, you guys know I'm funny, you know I can deliver, yeah. is this a Pavlovian reaction? If I was... If it was, eight, you know, 1985 and I was watching Rodney Dangerfield and he comes out and he goes... I'm so desperate to laugh. I know this he's going to deliver so hard. But as the comic, you're going, please don't give me anything I don't deserve because then I'm going to plateau as a comic. And I always want to go, be hard on me. And I think this past weekend I started going, feeling I think as a comic I'm getting some laughs that I don't deserve just because you guys know I have a history of being funny. Yeah. And I'm worried it's going to make me less funny. You're, you're, you're turning the resistance down on my exercise bike or whatever that means. That's why I go on late. I, I like to be the last act on the show because it's the hardest. They've already heard probably the same present premise like 30 different ways by the time I get up there. So it, it's harder. It also, like is um, I guess I'm better... I'm better. I'm better at that point, you know. I'm seeing, com and I don't want to bump anybody. I'm seeing a lot of <laughs> comics that I uh, uh, love and admire get plateau as artists because they're famous and their they their fans come to see them. Yeah. And and uh, they're um, atrophy. They're it help. It makes you atrophy. Like so, I'm finding that I'm having to create adversity f for uh, to get better because I'm worried that I'm coasting on my past achievements. I'm just curious if Rodney ever got frustrated. Can I, can I tell you some of that? Like, um, if we were um, in a small town, you know, someplace where, um, you know, maybe famous people didn't appear very often and Rodney would go to a local comedy club, the crowd would just go so nuts he didn't have to say anything. And you're right, he didn't like that, which is why he would try out material at clubs that are used to seeing famous comics, like the ones that are here locally, you know, in LA, you would go there all the time to try out material because you wouldn't trust an audience that, that it is just reacting to uh, who he is. Um, and, and at the local places here where they're used to seeing, you know, David Taylor. And well, no, I, you know? I'm curious, so, would he go to like the Hermosa Beach? Reaction. He didn't, he never told a joke on The Tonight Show or any place else where they were recording unless it had been tried out and killed. And sure. At it, you know. Again, I this is where I go back to how applause was more important to him after a, a joke um, gets a laugh because that that's like an extra um, proof to him. Yeah. Well, I'm wor um, I'm I'm worried that comedians were so afraid of coming off polished and corny and tr like uh, trying too hard that it's kind of turning more into a bravery contest of like I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna do a. I'm gonna open with a joke I've never told before, mm. and if it bombs, like, like I at least I was brave. I think that I find myself doing this. I find myself going like, I'm just gonna out myself. I'm gonna go. I'd rather Neil Brennan think I'm brave than make this whole crowd laugh. Like, mm. I think that'll some. Make you a better comedian, and that'll give you longevity. I think you're doing the right. Thing. But I think it's yeah. like, who's our allegiance to? It's like the uh, like. I think that right now, comics in a way, like I find myself trying to impress other comics with how brave, how, with how how hard, I, how deep a hole I, I can dig myself into and get out of it instead of just going, these people paid and I'm going to give them the burgers they ordered at McDonald's. Right. I'm, you know, so I'm going, let, you know, I'm going to dig a hole. You guys know I can make you laugh. Right. You, you know, it's like McDonald's. It's like McDonald's saying, "We know you came here for burgers, but I'm going to show you." Well, you're gifted. You're naturally funny anyway, and Rodney was too. I mean, this is. Like but Rodney would have probably been. Do you think Rodney would have been disgusted by the fact that comedians are going on stage, going, "What else is happening?" And just oh, go. Yeah, he made that. In fact, he didn't like the storytelling, the long, you know, to get to the punchline and all that. He didn't have the patience for it. Um, but back to being naturally funny and, and saying something off the cuff that just killed you. I mean, um, I told you about what Rodney said um, with not a brain surgery coma. The first words he spoke after, um, you know, being in a coma for something like, uh, I think it was 11 days, the doctors came in to ask him um, a question, and they were speaking really loudly. They weren't sure if he was going to respond or not. 
And the lung doctor said, um, yeah, Rodney, have you been coughing up much lately? And Rodney said, last week, 500 bucks for a whore. <laughs> ah! Just like that. Now, he couldn't have prepared that or yes. anything. He was just out of a coma. And uh, happy to be alive, right? And look at that. Delivered just like that. I mean, it blew them away. Boom, I almost fell off my chair. Because prior to the brain surgery, they didn't know would he be able to even, yeah. you know, put a few words together, much less write a, and deliver a comment like that that was off the cuff. In fact, before the brain surgery, Rodney, you know, was having like a heart to heart with me and he said, you know, I don't know, maybe I won't be able to even be in show business uh, after the brain surgery. Who knows? Uh, I don't know what I'll do um, because I'm too jealous to be your pimp. <laughs> ah! Ah! And, he is great and i that's think great and i think like with and without revealing too much i think like this is the only time i'm like hey tech billionaires Neuralink. like we do want to figure out how to preserve the brains uh like how do we yeah when someone's at their best we lose them true and it's like and and like and I'm the first to criticize tech and putting, you know, computers in our eyeballs. But I'm like, if we can, why are people these like, it's it's to me, it's like, I just lost both of my parents. And I, in general, I grieve harder at the loss of these great minds that we haven't preserved these brains and we're not protecting the great comics brains. I've watched <laughs> people's brains degenerate in front of me. Both, sure. both my parents had strokes. I'm watching my friends lose their parents to Alzheimer's, like these great we're preserving cars better than, like, you know, a, a, an overrated comedian's Porsche is preserved better than <laughs> uh, the brain of right. someone's mother. <laughs> like, so we're preserving the wrong things. Did uh, did Rodney ever like um, like because you know it took him a long time to find that amazing success, and I know that you know um, did did he feel like um. With with these crowds, because he, I, I remember seeing him to a very young crowd, and they loved him. Did he did he feel like he was relevant to them, or did he even understand what they thought was funny about that, or did he think that it was just like you know funny's funny? Because there really is now like you know it, it's almost like you know d depends on which way the wind blows in terms of like what a crowd gets, what a crowd doesn't, you know. You know, he always attracted. Well, they they used to say, I think the New York Times that that Rodney's a rare comedian whose popularity transcends generations. True. And it's true, I can tell you, like at the MGM Grand, when Rodney performed like the last 10 years, the mix in the crowd would be amazing. I mean, you, there was an older woman who actually died in the audience one night, um, you know, from laughing. I mean, she had a heart attack right there. Wait, hold on, hold on. Someone you know, had a heart attack? Yeah. And died? Yes. At the MGM Grand, yes, I was there at that night when I consoled the family while Rodney continued to perform. But my, my point is, too, in addition to, you know, the grain market, he had maybe even a more, uh, you know, predominance of the younger people. There would be college kids who couldn't afford to get a room who would come with their backpacks and they would line up in front of the um, Hollywood Theater door um, just waiting for him to come on stage. So it was amazing. The young college kids are, you know, barely in their in their 20s. And, and the older people as well. And, and, and that went on for a long time. I mean, Adam Sandler was taken to see our, one of Rodney's shows when he was 13. Great. And that's apparently that's why great. he became a comedian. It's like, wow. Um, well, I, know, I have one other question. That was the case all the time. There was a real mix. Um, that's awesome. So Rodney was performing. He was an opening act for, I think it was Vic Damone or somebody like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and they noticed, like, oh, no. They looked at the curtain and and he saw that there were all young people there. It's because the young people were there to see Rodney. Wow. Oh. You know, and sometimes the audience would do really great things, like to show that they didn't respect him. Uh, one one morning, uh, one night, I think it was in the 80s, I, I was there as well. Uh, they all brought newspapers. So they'd be sitting in the audience reading a newspaper, you know, as a little joke. That's and so funny. Better. Hey, y'all. Sick of smelling like wharf. Can't stand smelling like trout. Want to smell better naked? Hey, wait till I tell you about Lumi whole body deodorant for pits, privates, and beyond. And by beyond, you know what I'm saying. Lumi was created by an OBGYN who discovered... What a concept. A product being made by a doctor instead of a podcaster. <laughs> 
This OBGYN discovered and proved in clinical testing that the vagina is not to blame for day-to-day odor below the belt. So she developed Lumi, a uniquely formulated pH-balanced deodorant. It's aluminum-free, skin-safe, and clinically proven to control odor for up to 72 hours. Okay, so check this out. Lumi whole body deodorant. First of all, the toasted coconut is my favorite. It smells... Oh my God, it smells so good. You're just going to smell like a delicious like snow cone. I put it under my armpits. Yes, yes. But I also put it under my boobs because that is a crevice that sweats a lot because we all know mommy doesn't wear bras very often. Okay, so that one is like a... um, like a deodorant stick like you normally use, but this one is like a cream that you can kind of just like rub everywhere, which is kind of a miracle. I take this one on planes with me. Unlike some deodorants that try to mask odors with a fragrance, Lumi is formulated and powered by mandelic acid to stop odor before it starts, more like a pre-deodorant. It's aluminum-free, baking soda-free, trash-free, paraben-free, pH balanced for a safe use below the belt. Choose from a variety of fresh, bright scents like clean tangerine. That one I actually someone took from my house. I'm actually pissed because I haven't had the clean tangerine yet. I love the lavender sage, taste of coconut. I actually want to eat it. I wonder if you can. Um, Anyway, (laughs) Lumi's starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, which I'm holding right now, cream tube deodorant, which is just so darling, this packaging, uh, and two free products of your choice, like a mini body wash and deodorant wipes. New customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code Whitney at lumideodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use the code Whitney. Guys, don't sweat it. Gals, don't stink it. Time to not smell like grocery store sushi for no reason. Thank you, Lumi. Hold on, Dave oh. had one other question. And I have one other microphone now. And, now know, I'm now, really getting into it. We're, mm-hmm. Sorry, Dave, Dave had another question. There's a little bit of a delay, you guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yes, in my emotional development, and men- but also in this Wi-Fi situation. Uh, what's happening is nothing short of a technological miracle. So if you complain about the Wi-Fi connection, um, I hope Joe Rogan hunts you with a bow and that you die in cold blood. Um, so Rodney was so good to the young, I guess you could call it the next generation comics, you know, the, the Kinnisons and the Dom Iraras and the Bill Hicks. He's and, opened a comedy club. Yeah, and, and Roseanne Barr, all these different people, when he gave them the tap saying like, you know, you're going to be on my on my special, that was that he made their careers. And I always liked that about it. It looked like he really enjoyed doing that. Like he really enjoyed I'm like, saying, I think these a lot people of make me laugh. I like, want everyone to see. You know, how- it's, it's nature, nurture, whatever. I know we grew up, we all have this scarcity complex. Like I'm now, now that my parents have passed, I'm able to put together pieces of when my, you know, when food would hit the table, uh, uh, Weaver chicken McNuggets would hit the table. My sister and I would lick them Mm -hmm. to to basically claim the nuggets, you know, like scary when you grow up without. So it's like comedians, I think we're uniquely, um, we have very intense scarcity complexes and then we get into comedy and then we go... Mm -hmm. You know, I can't, we can't share. There's, you know, there's 4,000 theaters in America, more, more, I'm sorry, I just made that number up. Theaters, yeah, there's tons, tons. We can't possibly do every one every night. And we're jealous when other people, other comics succeed. Some of them, some of them. I, I always feel that like it's, it's, you know, especially like we were talking about joke writing. When when somebody knows how to write a joke, you you want to hear more jokes because it's just like so hard to actually write one and for one to actually work in front of a crowd. So when somebody can do that, or if there's somebody who's interesting and different, and like you definitely want to see it. And with the younger comics, you know, maybe there is like a now nowadays there's so many ways for them to actually platform themselves. So it's it's not really that same kind of uh, experience. But I always gave that to Rodney. I was like, man, everybody on his shows are like so funny and they all went on to incredible success. And that was really because of him. But it really always looked like when he did those oh, shows yeah, just, that he wasn't phoning it in. He really I, enjoyed but them. But I'm realizing... You know? His eye for talent was unmatched. He could tell, like, in yeah, two probably... seconds if somebody had it or didn't have it. Mm-hmm. One time we were back to his general. Who, who, who did he say wasn't funny? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. The comedians, by the way, and I, and I met so many, Rodney and I, you know, oftentimes there'd be a group of them over at our place, you know, for dinner or whatever. I don't think I've ever met an unintelligent comedian. Smartest people, like, in the world. 
um, become comedians. That's Still won't test their cocaine for fentanyl, but yeah, they're brilliant. But I was going to say he also was a connection true, to the really old. Um, he was connection to you know, the old you crew. Have to mix them all up. You know, there's a little time spent. You've got to surprise them. Uh, you know, to get that. You know action of laughter i think so what i'm realizing is like rodney had discipline yes and self-discipline is one of the hardest things to do because we're our own boss and normally you go to a job and someone says you have to work da -da -da, you have to produce this or you don't get paid and like i'm really struggling right now with self-discipline because I, i'm admitting it i'm i'm a phony i, I think feel like you you put you know, you're like, you put the work in. When it comes to other people, I can do it. And I'm finding, I I feel joy when I'm able to lift another comic up in some way or give them joy. Uh -huh. Like, like, like Atel just came on this podcast and I just, all I want is to make him laugh and bring him joy. Cause who heals the healers? Who makes, who, <laughs> what, what, what makes, the, what makes whatever. But, <laughs> but let me say something else. It's not a benediction. I know, you know what okay, I mean? Go ahead. But, but when Rodney came off stage, because now I'm a little bit worried, when I come off stage and, and get the laughs I've worked so hard to earn, I don't, I, I go, ugh, you, you fucking have, you should have fucking done this. You should, like. Well, we all do that. We rethink. all, yeah. did he come off, the time I get joy is when I see someone else soar. Yeah. Another comic soar or have a breakthrough or be brave. And, but did Rodney come off stage and ever be like, nailed it? Or was he like. <laughs> Seldom. He would listen to the recordings after, you know, if he was trying out material and so on. And then sometimes he'd want to turn right around and go back because he'd think of a way of, of improving a joke and wanted to see if he was right or not. He never like took his own judgment for it. Never took mine. Um, you know, he would always go back and he had to hear it from the, from the crowd. That was his barometer of success there. And, um, you know, and I think Ruby Anderson said something in an interview, which is so true, is that Rodney would take a perfectly good joke and then try to make it better. And this, I guess, is his discipline too, to just carry that much. Yeah. Um, he would Rodney to just keep honing it and keep honing it, you know? I think and today, I think perfect. today you get shamed for that. So when I try to make a joke great, people go, you have OCD. Mm -hmm. I had a psychiatrist, psychiatrists are trying to put me, like I was put on Prozac. They're like, you need to be on okay. medication. People are trying to put me on Adderall because they're like, you're so obsessive. That joke's already great. Why are you working hard it's to obsessing. make- It's obsessing. Yeah, it's, it's obsessive. obsessive no. but, but is that bad? Or is well, it? I think I think the genius mind that you do have, Whitney Cummings, believe me, you do have. See. I think it craves perfection, and that you want to keep going, and and there's a desire, an urge, a a, a compulsion, maybe to continue um, perfecting and perfecting, and then you get the result of that is that look around you, jet well, that four decades later, I mean, there are still people laughing at that um, at his. You know, through a second joke. He's by the way, because he he was built for Twitter. I mean, he, he was yeah, tweet. true. He, his jokes, he he his jokes were tweets. So bef true. Before yeah. Twitter existed, and 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 Atel does this, and so does Rodney. You're giving people the gift of when I when people sell merch, I'm kind of like I don't want to sell merch. My job is to give you the gift of being the funniest person at the office the next day. I need to give you a couple jokes you can repeat wow. at work. Yeah, and then I'm gonna make it so you can kill at work. Comics, we don't steal each other's jokes, but everyone here, the idea is you go home with some jokes that you can tell tomorrow and be the funniest person on your date. You can go, you have, you can flirt with a girl because you say, "So my dad, I grew up watching my dad use Rodney Dangerfield." <laughs> we'll never get it. I grew it's up. My body. <laughs> I, I grew up watching my dad use Rodney Dangerfield jokes on waitresses. Oh yeah, well, I'm telling you, he <laughs> That's he, he was like that. he was part of the Ryan national like you know it was it was yeah. like we 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 were all a part of it. But the one big compliment I'll give because I you've been really so nice generous with your time. Sorry, like, thank you. Sorry, and I know you have to go, Joe. And I'm being so selfish. Is that uh, you know not to make it all about comedy? Is that uh, doing a um, doing a Tonight Show or um, any of these TV spots where it's all to time and it's not. It's not really, uh, it's not really a fun experience of where like you basically hit a mark and you look in a camera and there's an audience there that's cold, 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 and they're like basically waiting and and for him to like 
kind of like you could tell like just how many of those has he done like the carsons he must have done 50 60 i mean i, I can only imagine how many he did he did 70 of the carson shuttle and i don't remember 35 of jay leno and and so on but it was so important to but winning the Carson Show was the most important thing. To for, him sure, in for sure, for sure, it was. It was. Know? It was the. It was the ultimate. But he. He. He was able every time to nail it, and like e even like, like I've done Letterman's and Leno's and all those all those different things. And I think today's generation of comics, they see these things, they go, "What do you get out of that?" But that was the thing that really helped you book clubs. It also told everybody who said, "You know, what are you going to do with your life?" That's what you're doing. So, mm. but the but the it most also, important was, thing was. Thank you for saying it's that. It's a lot of. It, it's so much work and so much stress to do that to take what you would do in a club over an hour and and condense it down to the whatever standards and practice uh would allow you to do for the six to eight minutes and he would do long he would go six hard seven hard standing and then he would panel for two breaks so that's another for him that was probably another 30 40 jokes so whenever he would do an appearance he's probably looking at 50 60 70 punch lines and that's like more than i can say that it's probably more than i have in my act right now so that's amazing that he was able to do that over and over and over and over again so he really had to train for it like By it was way, with a, no like email, a sport with no i the way that i memorized like my last special i called it jokes because i went i'm going to do it, jokes jokes yeah no fat zero i want to just experiment with this thing where a comedian just tells jokes and if if other comics think i'm corny if you think i'm hacky if you think i'm mainstream fine i'm just gonna do what i'm paid to do and just tell jokes and um uh and i would do voice memo like because my brain is i'm so dyslexic like like learning it le like i'll record it on voice memo listen back to it so i go these one one-liners I, 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 the only reason I'm able to remember it all because is I'm able to visualize it in thread. Did he have a system of how he remembered it all? He recorded all of the jokes in on a little um, tape recorder that he would get at Radio Shack, and then he would listen to it over and over and over again. It, so and he would right. stop it, rewind, and yeah, and that's that was his uh, memory. Okay, so we do the same because I can't read. read on memo. Also, he do wrote the note and write it now. That because also it's like you don't realize how much fat you're adding on stage when you're up there. Because I realized that I. Uh, remember Pat when I was like I say you know you know anyway you know yeah you, yeah yeah and I'm I like I didn't even realize I say you know forty times in an hour. Mm -hmm. It's trash. I bet, yeah, it's like sloppy. nervous ticks. And anyway, you know. So anyway, so you know what I'm doing. Yeah, and it, it it's the it could be the difference between mm -hmm. a laugh and an applause break. Yes, you know, and and the little things like when you realize that you're talking for an hour and every everything that you're talking about happened last week. Yeah. So last week I was on this flight. So last week I was at this yeah, family yeah, reunion. Yeah. So like, and you're like busy week. You know, mm -hmm. like just the little th ways that you have to one word will throw the audience and also the things you visualize like i think that that people have so little respect for what because we make it look easy you know and i think that it's like people because we make it look easy people think it's easy okay then why are comedians killing themselves with a doorknob right hanging themselves <laughs> you know what i'm saying then why do we hang ourselves with uh, on a doorknob and so to me it's like the amount of work that goes into should i say it, this word or this word uh, because our job is to make sure everyone is thinking the same thing at the same time and having the same image in their head. So, for example, there's this joke. There's this joke I was working on to get everyone to have the same image at the same time, especially with how fractured everything is now. Like words <coughs> mean something different to everyone now. So I was doing this joke uh, about like for my la the last special. The whole thing was like people think technology is dangerous. Um, you know, uh, people, uh, video games are dangerous, whatever. You think that's dangerous? We played with matches. Like growing up, we played with matches, right? Right. But every, but ha it would kill, but then sometimes it wouldn't. And then it would kill, and sometimes it wouldn't. And I was like fascinated. I was like, why is this such a mercurial joke? Why is this so unpredictable? And someone finally had the f kindness, a fan or who, not my fan, I don't believe in, and it was like my fans. They're comedy fans. They go see, right. they go yeah. see other people too. Go ahead. They're, they don't, and um, he said, I just want to tell you something. When I think of a match, I think of it not lighting. Oh, oh interesting. Oh, Everybody has a different image. So he goes, I don't think matches are dangerous at all because they never light for me, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh my God, there's different kinds of matchbooks. 
Oh, wow. Some of them light, some of them don't. And that's on me. It's arrogant to go, everyone is picturing the same book of matches that I pick because I picture one that's lighting and you throw in a fire that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know? So it was like, and, 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 and then all the way down to, we stuck our, put our fingers in light sockets. And then uh, uh, someone in a, a rural Richmond show went, well, we didn't have electricity, so the light sockets actually weren't ever dangerous. Oh, wow. You know, so it's like that's how... Everybody's own experience uh, affects the... That's how, like, specific we have to be. Because, like, when you we go down to town and we go... We have a joke about this uh, something something steakhouse. And then we have to go, is it Ruth Chris? Is it the Palm? What's the fanciest steakhouse sure. here? I need the reference to work for everyone. Because if I say... Or, What's the local grocery store? Is it Safeway? Is it Food Lion? Is it <coughs> is it uh, Publix? Sure. Is it whatever? Because if I say they're on grocery store for this joke, the whole rest of my set's fucked. Oh yeah, yeah. And they mm -hmm. think I'm they think I'm just like a robot coming in that doesn't know their town and they hate me mm. because I went like so. And next time you know when I go to the Giant and they they're say they have only a Safeway in their town and I've said Giant and they're like wait a second you've broken the spell that you're their friend or that you mm. know them and now you're just this Hollywood asshole. That so it's like, it's like- Rod, yeah, the intimacy is done with it. The, exactly, or the, what's your grocery store? What's the store you guys go to? Like that's what we started doing mm -hmm. in a way. And I, and I was like, when did we stop caring about the audience's experience and making them do our work for us? And I look at how hard Rodney worked on these details and it makes me have less shame because everyone diagnoses me as you're a workaholic, you're too ambitious, you work too hard. And I'm like, I don't think you can take other people's time too no, seriously. Yeah, no, it's... it's audience that or that was at the time maybe eight million people or so he wanted all eight million people watching to laugh at the same time and to get the jokes you know so it's a huge responsibility and and you know you have to you have to try out the material in, in order to be assured that it, it was going to uh work its magic and i don't know advice of not knowing i mean you got it how are you good well, just one more thing about like his Tonight Show, because I, I know this is like we could keep you here for hours and you're being very kind to like feel these questions. But when he would sit with Johnny and that's the ultimate, you know, like you, you've you made it and Johnny would um, basically set him up because that's what they want to know. Like a lot of people know this now, but it would be like, you know, so um, I hear you've been, um, you know, um, You've been on the road a lot. So and then you would tell your joke. So it looked like you're having like a conversation. So. I could I, I could see with with Rodney he had it all planned out and if Johnny didn't do it the way he was supposed to he would be like mm -hmm. a little upset like all right uh you know I the next joke is supposed to be this and you're kind of jumping ahead in the in the in the conversation and he wasn't like free form like that he basically knew what he wanted to do on both the stage and then also on the couch whereas for me I'd be like great let's what wait you, you whatever did you want to talk about something else besides what we planned on? That would be so awesome, you know? But let's go take a risk and jump off a cliff. But, but I would like the challenge of that. But I like also, like you said, his focus and his discipline is something that, you know, you can never get enough of I, in anything. But I think his point was, hey, buddy, we have a job to do. We can fuck around and improvise backstage. Yeah. But these people paid money to see the thing that we prepared. Right. We don't get to, we don't get to be the head chef yeah. at the best restaurant in the world and f screw around. And I think that's... I think that I, I'm yeah, Rodney thought Rodney thought the way you are thinking about that as well. And like if Johnny brought up the wrong cue or whatever, Rodney took control back by saying, uh, not yet. Yeah. Right? Something like that. And and it would become funny that he did that, right? And go right back to like if he had another joke about health or or getting old or something like that. I mean Rodney is stuck to certain themes here and there. Um, you know, but he would get control back. And he had the confidence to do that, you know. Um and and uh, and Johnny didn't mind. I mean, it just it worked. It all it all worked. But I think there's an embarrassment, uh, uh, comedians, so I'll and so on. Uh, I'll speak for myself. I think there's a little bit comedians were a little embarrassed these days to be prepared. 
You know, it's yeah. like it's like we're embarrassed to try too hard. Well, I'm full till corny now with all these jokes I'm telling, and I play the recorder as well. So I mean, honestly, I'm like I, but I'm just like, why do I hate myself for writing a perfect joke, and mm. then writing it? I'm like, oh god, everyone's gonna think I'm such a hack for writing and delivering that perfect joke. Like we're a little bit comedies in this place where it's like, well, why don't you tell a long, boring story about yeah, you know that sure. may or may not pay off at the end? Um, it's a little bit of a like a the sharing is what. what you're delivering it and if your persona is strong enough i mean people people think even the material is true i mean rodney used to get that all the time people thought his jokes were truth he would laugh at that later say yeah they think you know the dog comes to my leg and you know all that stuff um but but that's another thing i mean that comes into it is your delivery what, what did can i ask one more thing time warner um so everyone the, whoever q and on that stormed the capitol can you please all collude to storm spectrum Wi-Fi, like yes. start storming the right corporate, like for destroying the uh, this internet connection. With it's you, a, you have a twelve-room house with a one G uh, <laughs> wireless system here. <laughs> I um, mean, we're basically in a farmhouse. What, That's what, where we are right now. <laughs> we're, we're, <laughs> like ding, ding the dinner bell, and let's bring in the hired hands. <laughs> your house is so wonderful. It's a curine. I keep thinking about it all the time. By the way, the only reason, like. I only know I've made it in any way when Joan says like something that I have she likes. I'm like, oh, I've made it. Also, my favorite thing about Joan is that when I first met her, she brought me uh, a gift that was uh, she face little capsules of face cream made of salmon cum. Salmon cum. Oh yes. Deli is it called? Is it called delicious? <laughs> <laughs> it's salmon. It's salmon semen. Is that right? Yeah, yes, it is. She, she goes, goes, this is, I go, why Why do you look, f you know, like um, Ghislaine Maxwell would traffic you to an island is how young you look. <laughs> so I was like, so I was like, why do you um, look so young? And she brought me the capsules she used. It's for, they're from South Korea salmon comb capsules. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The red is kind on now, and, and and it's just it's really hard to get them now. But yeah, they're treasures. I shared a treasure with you, and I because you did there. But you're so amazing, I, you know, and I appreciate you so much. And, and we're gonna yeah. um go to um I'm drag kidnapping her and bringing her to Austin with me to bring something of Rodney's for uh, Joe's club to put in the green oh, room. Oh, that's great. That's really cool. To put something in the green room. So we're trying to figure out what to do exactly. And then, and then, by the way, this is my favorite. I was like, okay, we need to find a date that's special to Joe Rogan because she's like, oh, well, let me find a Tonight Show that's like happened on Joe's birthday that's Rodney's oh, or something so cool. special. And yeah. I was, and then I called Joe's wife and I was like, what's your wedding anniversary? Maybe we could do it as like, if there was a Tonight Show on your wedding anniversary. And I didn't even know this, or maybe I just repressed it. Joe's wedding, Joe got married on Halloween. <laughs> If that's not, if that's that not, makes a lot of sense. If yes. that's not the most stand-up comedian <laughs> shit, he's like, I have gigs booked every weekend. I have to be at like, you know, Penguins. The only time yeah, to get married is on Halloween. Wow, that's the only night we have open because you can't because you can't do stand-up on Halloween. That'll be so cool. First of all, I love that Joe does what he does and that he's building that club. I, I've been hearing about it for three three years now, two and a half years. I can't wait to see it in person. It's going to be awesome. Do you want to come on fans, Monday? I wish I could. I got to go up to uh, blah, blah. I got to go up to my gigs. But can you, but this Monday, we're going to do Kill Tony at the uh, mother. I can't. Okay. I got it. My mom, you know. Oh, I yep, get, yep. I got it. I've, I've been, been on the there. road now for 10 days. So, and then. But, but it's going to open. It's going to be huge. It's going to be comedy fans. It's going to be super fans. And it's also going to be a great spot for comics. It's like, this is like, clubs open and close all the time. But this is one that like, it's, it's, it's definitely. There's going to be nothing like it. And like Rodney, like r most comedy venues are, and clubs certainly are not. Um, and this is part of the reason I wanted to do the roasts, even though I didn't. It destroyed me in a way. My mom was in home hospice while I was making the roasts. Yeah, you really. Because I went, was... comedians are the only people 
that should be in charge of deciding how comedy clubs should be designed, mm-hmm. how they should be run, but we don't want to run businesses. We don't want to be responsible for shrimp going bad in a refrigerator. We don't want to be have employees. We're not yes. designed to have an HR department. So so comedy clubs are usually designed by people that aren't comics. Yes. You know, and and comedy shows are run by people who aren't comics. And then you have a bunch of people that went to uh, school for advertising telling us what is and isn't funny. So I, I'm putting myself in a situation where I'm like, I guess I have to run the roast because All right. no mm-hmm. one, you know yeah. what I'm saying, will protect us. But Rodney did that too. Rodney started his own yeah. club in New York and it was designed, you know. That is a classic venue. But remember, it was like you could pace back and forth because we pace a lot of these comedy clubs. They put you in a, like a, a, like in a hula hoop. You have a hula hoop to move and we pay, I pace like a panther because yeah, we're do. zoo animals. We're lions in the zoo and we're pacing, pacing. What? And the way, you know, so Joe's designing this to accommodate comedians instead yeah. of, um, you know, whatever businessmen usually design clubs he, for. It's gonna be, there's gonna be nothing like it. That's all I can say. And uh, thanks so much for uh, talking to us. And this was always a great surprise. So thank you, Whitney. This was great. It's a great surprise to me that um, I, the, the Spectrum, uh, that I have to go to court with Spectrum next week because I paid them for a hard line in here. Well. And I'm on the spectrum as well, so it's hard enough. It's hard enough for me to read the social, the the facial cues. Uh, are you on the spectrum with me? I didn't know that. Are you? I think Rodney was too. I was diagnosed with autism a bunch as a kid, but I beat it. But also, all those diagnoses, I think it's like it's very hard you know it's like i work with kids that are quote autistic now with equine therapy and it's like very the uh, tr- um being traumatized as a child uh has the same um i don't want to say masquerades because that's going to sound okay. pejorative it it uh, autism presents itself the same way as a kid who's traumatized a kid who's been abused mm-hmm. a kid that is like shy like they all kind of present so when you go like oh this kid's autistic like, you know, I was also had a s- severe sexual abuse and stuff too. So, and, and neglect people, you know, they're now showing like uh. neglect in a lot of ways. It, I'm not saying it's worse than being um, uh, abused. It's, um, you know, embarrassing to like, you know, not be the one that was picked to, by the priest. It's a little All bit, right. it's well. like a rejection and whatever, but being, <laughs> but so- neglect you have your own internal world and you don't learn to be socialized. So I was kind of like fair. Huge impact. Uh, Rod Rodney was not verbal. Um, He was so, but I, the YouTube, that why I think. He was not what? Writing verbal, like verbal. I'm not good at speaking, believe it or not. Like that's why jokes, like I, I think in terms of jokes and I think that something Rodney has, all comics that I love have is when you hear a word, Right? There's a role. So when Rodney said um, he heard the word cough, right? Most people think cough, but we have a Rolodex that goes cough means a lot of different things. Mm. We're going to go to the third definition in Webster's, not the first. So so I think that's the difference between comics. So so we, you go, um, you coughed something up. We're going to go, yeah. Yep. We're going to go to the third yep. definition in Webster's, not the first. Everyone's going to go to the first. I don't hear, when I hear cough, I don't hear that so mm-hmm. comics i'm repeating myself because if someone doesn't tell me to stop talking i won't no, <laughs> so so i never i never heard the same thing everyone else it. heard I and it. i and we don't see the things everyone else sees you well, know? that's interesting so like people were probably you know not to keep it going on and on but sorry they probably you know it's always like the guy on stage and the guy off stage there was a, he was quiet he was a little shy correct like uh you know maybe off stage it wasn't like he's like like uh you know um like in the movie, you know, like, like where he's like, let's party. You know, he's just like basically a, Cause I, cause a, my, regular, go- a regular dude. And that's always disappointing to the Because my thing is I have something funny and interesting to say, but if you guys are talking and distracting me, I can't get it out. So I need to oh. get security guards to tell everyone to shut up no, yeah, yeah, so yeah. that I can get it out because I get overwhelmed and I like, and I need to rehearse it a lot, you know, because I also had a speech impediment. So I would have to like rehearse it. So that's why I was like, I'm not good in conversation. It's like, remember Memento? I'm not good on the phone. You know? It's like, I think we get famous and known for how good we are at talking, but people don't know how much work went into being able to say it publicly. And then, 
I think I've tricked people into believing I'm really good at talking, but like all the stuff you've seen, I've like practiced and practiced and practiced and that's the only reason it came out. I look like I'm good at it. Do you think you should go on stage with somebody behind you holding this up like it's your Ten Commandments and then they, if the crowd sucks, you just smash it and like you, you, you have uh, defiled. Can I tell you what you did for me? The God of comedy. So, so can I tell you the most traumatic and then, and then we, I will let everyone go and stop imprisoning them. Um, uh, so the top of that set, see how he's, he wrote great crowd with two exclamation marks, Rodney Dangerfield. See at the top. I didn't see that. Great crowd, two exclamation points. Okay. So top, top left of that. Yep. Do you see it? Up left, 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 left. Keep going. Here. Keep, see down. Yep. To your right a bit. Sorry. I'm so dyslexic. Do you see that it says, do you say it says great crowd? Do you see that? No. Oh yeah. I see it. Great it, crowd. Great crowd. He wrote great crowd with two exclamation marks. So, sorry, go I ahead. I thought that was him like, hey, you're a great crowd. But he wrote it out. <laughs> yes. One of the most traumatic moments of my life, and I've been molested by hitchhikers that were <laughs> like, <laughs> one of the most traumatic moments of my life, and I did stand up on Last Call with Carson Daly. One of the most traumatic moments of my life was <laughs> Dove Davidoff, a comedian, New York guy now, back. That's, you want me to hold this up? That's me and my horse. Yeah, do you want to hold up a picture of my horse while I'm... Um, a calming image, maybe. <laughs> Keep the... Go ahead. Is I had written out... I was going to do the Brea Improv. Mm -hmm. And I had written my jokes out to try to memorize them. You know? And... Uh, and I and and Dove Davidoff like got in my car, a friend of mine, and just like picked up my set list just to screw with me. And uh, was like, I was like, I have to go to Brea, I have to go to Brea to do this set. I was this, I was probably had only been doing comedy maybe like four years. And he picked up my he's like, Oh, you print out your jokes. Like we were just messing around. Mm -hmm. And he grabbed the jokes and he's like, You write out your jokes, you dork. And then he looked at them, and the top line was what's up Brea, question <laughs> mark. He goes, what's up Brea? He's like, you had to write this yeah, out? Yeah. Like you you were worried you'd forget that? <laughs> and I was like so embarrassed. It was like one of the most embarrassed I've ever been. But like sure enough, sometimes I'm in Brea and I say Irvine or sometimes like one of the- Ontario, let's name the whole chain. Let's, by the way, you and then you go wherever the fuck I am. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you're dead for the rest of the set. You're dead if you say, if you're in Brea and you say, where am I, Irvine, Brea, is disrespect, you know? And I just wanted so badly to not go into someone's, have someone pay money to see me disrespect their town. Yeah. And I was like, and then I was like, wait a second. And then seeing that set made me proud to be a dork. It made me proud oh, to be a yeah. nerd that works hard. Yeah. And if comics think I'm lame, like, okay, but like, they don't, you guys don't pay money to come see this. I mean, this is it. This might be a bad analogy, but like, seeing the set list, it's like getting to hold Lincoln's axe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, it's just like historic. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's just like, I think it just, Rod, like studying Rodney makes me go, oh, maybe I don't have to be on all these meds that these psychiatrists want me to be on because I work hard. Yeah, no, you're fine. You know what I mean? Joan, you, Joan, you're awesome. Anyway, I love you. if you're in New York, come by the Comedy Cellar, please. Also, what's it like to know that Hitler wouldn't have killed you? <laughs> oh, yeah. I love you, Joan. Thank you for letting us ambush you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna work out. We're gonna work out flights to to go to Austin. Um, and we were just recording this podcast, and and Rodney just came up because um, Atel was talk. Atel was talking about how someone, a comic, just said, you know, if you have too many jokes per minute, you know, you're like, like less jokes per minute is better now or something. And he, we, him, and I were commiserating about it, and I went, no, 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 like, and I pulled Rodney's set. And I was like, this is the this is the gold standard. And anyone that is trying to lower the jokes per minute for an audience is just being lazy and uh like this like I just want to remind everyone like this is what we're supposed to be doing. Oh, thank you, Rodney with the and appreciate you so much. Like I'm not I'm not being elegant in the way that I'm saying this, but I'm just like 
you know, this is why comedy fans are upset <laughs> because people, comedians aren't doing comedy anymore for them. They're lecturing them how to vote. They're, they're not honoring their time. They're disrespecting their time. They're showing up unprepared. They think, a lot of comedians think if I'm just on stage and being authentic, like I'm, uh, that's not what they're paying to see. They're paying to see a surgeon do surgery. They're, they're paying to see a craftsman do their craft. And I just needed that reminder. Um, and I think everyone needs that reminder. I agree. That the kind of people that pay, to, that, that pay to see comedy need to laugh. And we're tricking people into coming to comedy venues. And we're like, hey, we're going to make you laugh. And then you get in their seats. And then we lecture them how to vote. <laughs> I missed. I missed out. I, I kind of tuned down after the salmon semen uh, treatment. <laughs> I love you. I love you, Joan. Oh, oh! I just hung up on. Jo <laughs> okay. She was well, great. that was uh, so. What a great treat. Thank you. You know who gets less respect than Rodney Dangerfield? Poor Joe. Poor His Joe. widow. <laughs> Poor Joe. You know who truly gets no respect? Um, before I, you. At first, I said your dad. I still. I, I was like, whoa! It blew me away how great she looks. I, 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 unbelievable. Yeah, awesome. Right? So and that's, she lives out here, right? That's what it looks like if you... Um, laughter is the best, not only medicine, but the best dermatology. It's amazing. I love you so much. Thank you, Whitney. Uh, David, I think about you a lot. I hope I always hope good things for you. So Ditto, ditto, ditto. Yeah, and since um, we both don't sleep, you can always call me in the middle of the night. I'll be up. I love bye. you. Bye. Sorry, I love you. Sorry. Bye. <laughs>